<coughs> so my name is Will. I came to Bonsgrove School. I left Bonsgrove School in 2010, and then I went to Leeds University, which is the best city in the north, of course, and did a medical degree and a medical physics <coughs> degree as well. And um, I guess I'm here today to talk to you about some of the stuff that we've been doing up in Leeds around sort of the healthcare technology stuff, so hopefully it'll be applicable to non-medics as well. So just by way of background, broadly I work for two main groups. Um, I'm a surgical trainee by background. I work for something called the Surgical MedTech Cooperative, which develops new technologies for the NHS to improve the way that we treat surgical conditions. And more recently I've got involved with a group um, called the Global um, Surgical Technologies Group, which is looking at improving surgical care in developing countries. So, um, and I've done some time with the World College of Surgeons and the University of Leeds, but everything I tell you, about, they're my views, they're not the views of the university or anyone else. Um, so, I thought we'd better start by just sort of spelling some myths, and I find it quite interesting to reflect and think, what do um, surgical trainees do? And I'm sure you've got your own sort of prejudices and so on about what I would do. So, I'll try and go through it um, systematically for you. So. Uh, what my mum thinks I do. So she thinks I run down the corridor with sick patients, uh, like they do on TV, and she also thinks I do loads of reading in the library. But of course, uh, you know, I very rarely run down the corridor with sick patients, I sometimes do that, but very rarely, and I haven't been to the library for a very long time. Um, then what society thinks I do? Make mountains of money. <laughs> and then of course I use that to buy Ferraris and play golf. I've never picked up a golf club in my life, so we don't really do that. What my non-medical friends think I do? Does anyone know who these guys are? What's that? Oh, God. Grey's Anatomy. Yeah, Grey's Anatomy. Yeah, yeah. So you, okay, good. I thought I'm not that old. <laughs> um, yeah, this is nothing like what we do. You know, these guys are having more sex in one episode of Grey's Anatomy <laughs> than, than, you know, than I get in the run of the room. So this is absolutely nothing like what we do. <laughs> Uh, what do I think I do? Um, I think, you know, I'm sort of really determined, I'm a workaholic, I'm a badass, and uh, I um, do loads of cutting edge research, which means I get published in journals like Nature, and obviously I'm a surgeon, so I've got a god complex. Uh, like, like we all do. But uh, what do I actually do? I drink loads of coffee, uh, because we're really busy and really tired and we don't sleep very much. Does anyone know what that is? <laughs> so, I promise you, right, I'll never forget this, one of the first things I learned when I became a doctor, right, it wasn't how to prescribe drugs or treat sick people, it was how to use a fax machine. I'd never used one before, right, and I wanted an x-ray for a patient, and she was like, you have to fax it, and I had to get you taught how to use a fax machine. Anyway, we'll go and stand in more detail in a minute. And obviously I play Surgeon Simulator on the phone. <laughs> so that's what I actually do, I hope that dispels some of the myths. Um, but as well as being a doctor, I try and do some extra bits of stuff. I'm doing some research at the moment, part of a PhD, again, looking at surgical technologies. And the reason why we're doing that, or why I think we're doing that, is because uh, we have this problem in the NHS, and you, it's, it's all over the news all the time, where we have limited resources, so we have limited money, limited people, but we've got unlimited, almost unlimited uh, demand for those resources. Yeah, we've got more and more people, we're living longer and we're getting older, and living on with disease. So we have this imbalance in the equation, and it's only going to get worse. So antibiotic resistance is something that's really important to me, because if we don't have antibiotics at work, then we can't do surgery, um, elective surgery, which means surgery that's planned, because you'll get an infection and die from it. Healthcare services are really, really expensive, and a lot of that has to do with technology, the rising cost of technology, so how do we choose which technologies to uh, buy and use, and how do we develop them to be cost effective? Mental health is a really big thing, yeah. I don't know if it's because we're recognising it more, just because we are getting more mental health disease, but that's going to be huge. And um, an ageing, complicated population. We have lots of different diseases. So, uh, sorry to start on a downer. But I also think it's important to think what is technology. And broadly, it's just a tool. It's just, um, it's just something that we use. Anything that we use as a tool is a technology. I and mean, we've gone from sort of stones to metal. It allowed us to do some farming, which made us get more food so we could feed more people and build nice buildings like that. And then eventually we had this uh, mechanisation where we were making machines that were doing a lot of the work for us. And we had this technology evolution. And we're now in something called the fourth industrial revolution, which is basically the age of uh, information and digital technologies and so on. So this has brought, each time that we've sort of developed a new technology or a new you know, change in technology, we've pulled loads of people out of poverty and it's given us in this country loads of conveniences which we take for granted all the time, like 
Uber and Amazon, I'm sure you all use that or some, to some degree. I use it all the time, completely change the way that we, that we get taxis and you know, same day delivery. As soon as I heard that, I just bought a book just to see if it would come and it was there before dinner. Um, you can catch a plane that can be anywhere in the world within 24 hours and I'm absolutely confident that in not too much time we'll be going to space and so on, just like we are flying a plane. And then our personal computing power in our phones and iPads and stuff, it's just never been as good as it is today. Uh, you know, when my mum was my age, she was a computer technician. I promise you, she used to work on computers that would be as big as a room, right? And she did hundreds of those computers to do the same thing that an iPhone can do now. So, you know, what's happened in 30 years for her, that's going to be your five years. Yeah, the pace is going to get quicker and things are going to start developing in quick. So, um, the reason why I'm interested in technology and healthcare is how do we leverage all this? Because um, inside healthcare, Technology has been somewhat okay, so we've got a really nice, this is an MRI scanner, so you lie on the table and go through a big donut, a big magnet essentially, and there's lots of cool stuff. And you can see inside the patients and you can uh, diagnose lots of conditions that we've never even been, we would never have thought we could do only sort of 30 years ago. Uh, we can do single incision surgery, so rather than having a nice big cut, you just put one little cut in the belly button, all your instruments and camera go through and you can chop out entire organs and stuff without making such a big a cut. And um, yeah, genetics of course, a huge thing, game changer, we can now uh, genetically profile uh, millions of people if we wanted to and figure out what diseases we're going to get and uh, we're in the process of trying to figure out what diseases we can prevent with that knowledge. So we've made some, some progress, but some things when I was doing my research um, for this talk, we hasn't fundamentally developed at all for a very long time. I mean, you can see that there has been an evolution, but you know, fundamentally they're the same thing. And I think by now we should be doing much better for people who don't have limbs. Yeah, we should be able to move it properly, and we should be able to sense from it. The technology is there, but we're just not using it properly at all. Uh, I know I spoke about single incision, but that type of surgery is only done in less than 10% of the world. You know, the vast majority of operations are done with kit. That is fundamentally identical. It's just wrapped in blue stuff there. So we're, we're lagging behind there. And uh, this is a, a way to train midwives on how to deliver babies. And you know, fundamentally, it's, it's a funny image, I find it very funny. But um, fundamentally, we have, it hasn't changed. It's still a model. And this, I mean, some of you may know, but this doesn't represent the real anatomy at all. And it's nothing, uh, it's nothing like the real thing. You know, when we take blood out of plastic arms, for example, we're still training on rubber. And it's just shouldn't, it just shouldn't be the case anymore. So I think we've got a long way to go, and uh, it's this concept of innovation, and innovation in healthcare is really, really slow. I mean, fundamentally, there's loads of definitions for innovation, and uh, mine's obviously the best, but it's, it's doing something new, so you have to do something that has to be new, that just adds value. That's all it is, right? And in healthcare, we've been much slower to innovate, and there's lots of reasons for that. You know, how many times have you picked up a newspaper and seen, you know, hospital praised for innovating a new technology? Like, that's never happened, is it? But every single day you hear hospitals <coughs> getting it wrong, trying something new and it going wrong. Just last week there was a robotic heart operation and they're all getting, you know, sacked for that. So if you're always punished, regardless of what you do, you're not going to try and change anything because you just say, status quo, let's keep going as we are. So, you know, this is an analogy for innovation. If these, all these fishes are swimming doing the same thing, and this one thinks, I'll do something new, and if it's too big a hole, creates more value. It's really difficult to do that. And then, as I said, you know, in healthcare, it's really, really slow. So you've got this balance between <coughs> making sure we don't hurt patients and we don't um, you know, cause harm by basically practicing and innovating, um, but also there's a need to innovate and change and improve our care for patients. So moving on to surgery, so obviously I'm interested in surgery, I want to be a surgeon, I'm, training, I'm a surgical trainer at the moment, and this is just a spiel that just says that basically surgery is a good one because it costs a lot to do, it's you know, four and a half million hospital admissions, it's very common procedures, and it's you know, one and a half billion pounds worth of the NHS spend. And these are the main ones, so general surgery, which is basically everything in here, it counts for the majority of the operations we do, and then orthopedics, and bones and joints, the neck. And uh, the government basically said, any technology that we can do to try and improve that is going to create a lot of cost saving benefit, hopefully. So, thinking about surgery, oh yeah, I apologise, there will be some images of people's um, guts and stuff having operations, but that's because it's a surgical talk, so I'm sorry about that. But we've, you know, in the past, we've done really big cuts all the way down the tummy so that we can get our hands and elbows in and do the operation with our hands, yeah? But then you get this, this is a giant, come on, this is a giant hernia, yeah? So, 
you've cut through all the muscle layers and then the patients just end up with a really un uncomfortable hernia. They can be life-threatening if the bowel gets stuck in them. So we've gone from that to this minimally invasive stuff now, and this is someone's colon. This is the whole large bowel, which you just remove through a single incision. So much smaller scars, much less scarring, um, much less pain, quicker recovery, and all the rest of it. Um, and that's taken like you know, 30, 40 years to happen. And we're kind of thinking, well, where should we go next? So does anyone know who that guy is? Yeah, and who is he in this film? Terminator, thank God, I thought I was, you know. Um, and he's, he's holding a scalpel, so he's a robot surgeon, that's the joke there, I think. So we've gone from this, and now we've got this, you know, this, 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 um, this next evolution, which is robotic surgery, which is something that we're interested in. And um, it, over the last sort of 10, 15 years, it's become really, really popular. And when it was invented, this is called the Da Vinci robot, and it's just for a long time they dominated the market, because they just patented everything, and they were the, the, the dominators. And when they, when they released their um, robot into the market, everyone in America bought one, everyone got one, yeah? And they were like, oh, come to our hospital and give us all your money because we have a robot. And the, to a large extent, the same happened in Europe and the UK. And um, we were all thinking, you know, is it just a toy? I mean, this surgeon's built a sandwich with it. So <laughs> this isn't cheap as well. It costs one and a half to two million pounds. And a lot of that is in the software, but you know, it's, it's a big investment for a hospital. So we, we have a responsibility to make the most out of the limited resources that we have. So what I became interested in was how do we, how do we evaluate the effect of these two technologies against each other? Because on the one hand, you've got the normal keyhole surgery, which essentially uses non-robotic instruments. They're just giant chopsticks, yeah? And then a camera to do the operation. Versus a robot, which is completely powered by machines, and the surgeon actually sits at a console away from the patient, and it's got much more range of movement, better vision in theory, and all this stuff. But ultimately, it doesn't matter how nice and shiny this is, it only matters if it's cost effective, yeah? If it improves the care of the patient, and that makes it worth the cost. So, um, obviously this is a huge team effort, and I was a small cog in this wheel, but um, what we did was we designed a, a proper clinical trial, which is an experimental study comparing these two. So, we did it in 10 countries, we had 400 patients in there, and you randomly allocate them, so you do something called randomize, where you recruit the patient and then you just basically roll the dice and whichever one they fall into, they have that operation. And the idea of that is just to make it, all the effects are gonna be equal on both sides. So on the one hand, we had half the patients having normal laparoscopic or keyhole surgery, and on the other half was robotic surgery. And the operation was for rectal cancer. So cancer at the low end of the colon, because it seemed to be that the robot was, the, the people who were making the robot were selling it to improve outcomes for rectal cancer. So we were like, fine, let's just answer the question once and for all. And when you're designing a comparison study, so treatment A versus treatment B, you have to have an outcome. What's the most important outcome from that study? And it has to kind of be comparable. And the idea of the technique was that we were allowed to go from open, which is just the traditional big cut, to keyhole, yeah? If you are struggling to do a keyhole, then the safe thing to do is to convert to open. So you go back to the open option. So your rate of conversion is a really good outcome, yeah? Because the idea of the robot is that because it's got more ranges of movement, better camera and all this stuff, you shouldn't need to go to convert as much as the normal keyhole. This is what we're here for. And uh, up till then, the studies had showed that you convert around a third of patients that you start with keyhole, conventional keyhole. So we were thinking there'd be about a 30% chance of the laparoscopic guys converting. So we wanted to see how much the robot would convert. And we found that 8.1% conversion rate, which we thought, yes, that'd be really, really good, because if the laparoscopic wasn't E30, then this had dropped it by, you know, down to a third, so it'd be really, really effective. But unfortunately, or fortunately, for the patients, of course, we got much better at laparoscopic surgery. So the rates were actually quite similar, yeah? And you still think there's a 4% difference here. And if you did it enough times, it might be, it might be important, but uh, this is just a load of numbers, but essentially an odds ratio says, you know, what are your odds of having a conversion if you're in each of the groups? And if you have an odds of one, it means you've got the same. If your odds are less than one, then you've got less chance. If your odds are more than one, then you've got more chance. But because this goes from 0.31 all the way to 1.21, it crosses one, so there's no difference. Yeah, If we'd had more patients, we might have been able to find one. But the important thing is, when you're thinking about technology in general, but also particularly in healthcare, is your cost effectiveness. Because it doesn't matter if it's clinically effective, if it costs so much more. Because like I was telling you, you have a budget, yeah? So, 
This is the incremental cost, which means that to do a robotic operation, it costs about £1,000 more than to do a non-robotic operation, yeah? So that's the cost, part of the equation. The quality, or the improvement, or the benefit, the cost effect, comes from something called a quality which means, which stands for quality adjusted life here. So it just means that one extra year lived in quality life. It's a bit nebulous, but they work it out somehow. Um, so you get basically 0.14 more, type, more years of quality life if you spend a thousand pounds. And when you do the equation to basically work out the ratio, it's coming out around 70,000 pounds per quality. And just for context, the people that decide how much money we should spend per um, per quality, a, a group called NICE, the National Institute for Care and Clinical Excellence, basically the government, and because they've got to make sure that they're spending it on appropriate stuff. And their upper limit is around 20 to 30,000 pounds per quality. So this is three, you know, nearly three times too expensive for the amount of benefit it gives, yeah? But everyone was adopting it, everyone was using it. So, you know, we recorded on this, and uh, actually the rates of robotic surgery are going up. But one of the pro primary reasons for that, and I think they'll continue to rise, is because a lot of the original robots come off patent now. So loads of companies in Cambridge and London are making cheap robots. So I think as the price comes down, it will become more effective. But anyway, so that's kind of an example of um, why it's important to properly think about your technology and how to make sure that it's effective enough in high-income settings. So I'll just move to another area of research that we're doing, which is in low-income settings. And um, we're basically working in northeastern India, right up here is China. So right on the China border in the Himalayan foothills, and also in Sierra Leone, which is in West Africa. And um, we're a really nice multidisciplinary team. So we've got some surgeons, some global health guys, the health economics guys who are saying, you know, making cost-effective stuff, the trials which make the comparison studies, and then engineering which make the kit and all the tests. And um, this, is, this is born out of a concept called global surgery. And um, does anyone who wants to be a doctor want to work abroad or do sort of, you know, maybe some humanitarian stuff? I mean, I never really considered it, but I would definitely, I'd definitely go for it um, if I were you. But again, surgery is a good one because it's one third of all disease, basically, is surgically treatable disease. So across the world, one third of it is uh, surgically treatable. And the most common operation, about half of all operations in the world is their sections. And then the next big ones are the big tummy operations that I was showing you, and then fixing fractures of the leg, of the leg and arm, basically. And um, not only is it really common, but about five billion people don't have access to any surgery. So, you know, we take it for granted here. If we walk down the road and we fell over and broke our ankle, you know, we just get it fixed, go to hospital and sort it out. But that's just not the case for the vast majority of people. And, you know, every single day, I mean, it results in 50,000 people just dying from preventable conditions, things like appendicitis. You know, has anyone had appendicitis here? No? Okay, anyone broke the bone? Okay, yeah, fine. It's a, bit, it's a bit confidential. One person with a bad bone, bone, fine. But anyway, you know, these simple things which we should take for granted that we can get fixed, it just doesn't happen. So in India, we're working on the keyhole surgery. Yeah, this is a camera, and it's going in, and he's putting his instruments through the same hole, and you can do the same operation. And it's, it's a really important technique because the patient can go home the same day. So in this country, if you have your appendix taken out by a keyhole, we'll just put some plasters on, and you'll go home the same day. Um, and you know, if you're if you're living like hand to mouth, like literally, like every day you get paid, expended to eat food. You know, any any time of work could be catastrophic. You know, your family could go into um, spiraling poverty and all the rest of it. So, if you have to have a big cut, you'll probably have to have three or four days of work. So, what we've done in order to improve the access to this care is produce this device, which is essentially a giant corkscrew which goes into the cut that you make, and it lifts up the front of the tummy wall. Yeah, and lifts it up. So you can create space, and you don't need all the fancy airtime gadgets that we use in this country. So um, it dramatically improves access. And then this this laparoscope here, which is a, a camera, all a, all a laparoscope is a keyhole camera. is essentially a camera on a stick with a light. But the, the ones we use in this country are nearly ten thousand pounds, right? Whereas the company that we we're working with called Xenocore in America have made this for around hundred dollars. It's just got a really nice iPhone camera and a light on a stick. That's all it is. And you plug and play into any screen. So these are some of the technologies that we're working on. You see how much more cost effective that would be, right? So that's what we're doing in India. In Sierra Leone, we're working on injury. And you know, you might hear in the news HIV, TB, and malaria, like really big public health things in, in, in developing countries. Um, but sort of what this shows is that injury, breaking bones and 
hurt himself, getting burnt, or whatever, causes way more deaths than all of them put together. So it's a really big one to go for. Um, this picture, when I first saw it, I thought it was um, like a satellite image of uh, Europe on a clear night sky, but actually it's not. There's no lights or anything in this. It's, um, all this is is a geolocation of billions of tweets over a period of a month. Um, that, it was really interesting to me because it perfectly outlines all the cities, all the countries, all the places that we live and work. And then when we scale it up, it's pretty representative, you know, most of, the, most of the world has dots. And what we found is even in Africa and uh, the really rural parts of India, everyone has a smartphone, yeah? Um, they don't have like running water in their house, but we all have smartphones and they charge it up in their car when they drive around and so on. So we're looking at ways of using that technology to try and improve the way that we train people remotely, essentially, train surgeons remotely. The fracture stuff that we're doing, so this is, this is your shin bone. So this is the knee, and this is the shin bone here. So we've basically taken an x-ray of here. And it's a crap x-ray because it's from um, somewhere else using a large film. <coughs> but they've broken their tibia. So what we're looking at is we're trying to use, this is called a circular frame fixator. Um, and all it is, literally all it is, is big spokes that go through the bone and you attach it to a, attach it to a ring. The ring is bolted together on the outside. And it's super simple, and basically it means that the patient can start walking straight away. Um, without this, their management option is just lying in bed with skin traction and a cast, which we just we haven't used in this country for since the 50s. Um, but that's going to be interesting to see if we can do that. So I'll just quickly go through one case. So um, this is a hospital called the Sanga Hospital in a rural part of Sierra Leone, and the majority of their patients are just in bed with broken legs, essentially. And um, we uh, this is the this is what it looks like out of the hospital. So this is a river. And there was loads of, there's loads of mining happening in this area, and yeah, it's a really wealthy country actually, it's got loads of diamonds and resources, but what happens is people like us and from other developed countries come in and just steal, <laughs> steal their diamonds, that's what's happening in the background there. But you can see it's completely tropical, completely in the middle of nowhere, so doing surgery is a really difficult problem. And this is an image intensifier, so this is an intraoperative x-ray machine to take x-rays through the leg or through the body or whatever you want. But it's broken, so they just keep it outside as like, a, like an ornament almost. <laughs> So it's a really challenging environment. And um, one of the primary problems in surgery in developing countries is trying to train your workforce because you have to have a lot of uh, motor skills and you also have to have, 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 to have all the science and knowledge behind, it, behind you in the background. And um, this is where the sausages come in. So we were planning a, um, a surgical training day for um, all these trainees that they have there. And uh, for, for our veterinary colleagues here, um, Humans and pigs are extremely similar, yeah, some more than others, but um, inside we're almost identical, and that's why they use pig valves and so on in people's hearts. You can put a pig valve in someone's heart to replace the valve. So we were thinking, let's do um, uh, a bowel operation using pig valve, yeah, which is just sausage skin, yeah. And so I asked the guys that were, that were hosting us, we're going to need some pig valve. And they were like, okay, sure, we'll, we'll sort that out. And normally you just go to a butcher's and just ask for some pig valve, and you, just, you take it and do it. Anyway, they were, due, they were due to arrive, they were due to deliver the pig bowel at something like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And I just saw this pickup coming down the road and I could hear a pig squealing in the back. And I thought, oh God, they've bought a cat from my pig. Anyway, so this pig is alive, the poor thing. And um, anyway, we really need to do the training so that we can train the next generation um, sacrificing the pig. Um, but don't worry, we, we trained the next generation of surgeons and we also ate it in the barbecue afterwards, so every part of the pig was used. <laughs> anyway, these are the sausages, yeah? So this is, this is a little bit of pig bowel. And uh, these are um, Sierra Leone colleagues, and that's me smiling there, and this is one of my bosses, and that's my other boss. And anyway, we're doing, um, we're basically cutting the pig bowel, and then they've got to stitch it back together and we inject it with water to see if it's there, and, you know, water type and so on. A uh, really common procedure that we have to do in, in surgery. And that's just a close-up of the pig. So that's literally just sausage skin, um, fresh out, yeah, ready to go. So it was, it, was, um, it was a good training exercise. And um, I'll just take you through a case before we finish. So this is a 17-year-old boy, so some, some of you guys will be 17. And uh, he came to the hospital with about a five-day history of really bad stomach pain. And we quickly scanned him with an ultrasound. He had loads of fluid in his abdomen where it shouldn't be, essentially. So uh, that's not a good thing. Um, and he was really sick. And the hospital isn't government funded like ours, like ours would be, yeah? So it's not a profitable organization, it's a cost recovery system. So 
uh, you say how much it costs and then you wait for them to pay before you operate. Because you can't operate for free otherwise you'll run out of resources. So it cost the equivalent of £50 to operate on this patient. But we had to wait for around five, six hours for him and his family to go around the village and get a whip round. And um, obviously I was like, well, we could just pay for it, but you can't do that for everyone. So it was a pretty tricky situation, but eventually managed to get the, the, the money and um, did the operation. And the, the, what they're doing here, so this is one of our one of our colleagues and this is one of the advanced trainees who should basically going to supervise, do the operation. And um, they pray before every operation. And uh, it's, it's part of the tradition, and basically some, some, some people are Muslim, some people are Christian. And if you ask them which one they prefer, they often just say both, because the outcomes for this patient is really poor, yeah? So the chance of death in this case is super, super likely. Um, they don't even have general anesthetics. So you know what general anesthetics is when you fall asleep and you're completely painless, completely um, you know, comfortable, and you wake up and it doesn't, you don't, nothing's happening. Well, they use something called ketamine. It's a drug of abuse, and it's also a horse tranquilizer. See, I'm getting you guys in, I'm putting you in. Um, uh, but it's a really crap anesthetic. Yeah? We sometimes use it on, on the roadside, so sometimes we'll do an emergency anesthetic, but its, uh, it's effects are really difficult to predict, so if I give you a little bit, it might send you to sleep, but I might give you a lot, and it might not even touch you, you know what I mean? So it's really difficult to predict. So what they do is they literally put a slug in, the patient falls asleep, they refill the syringe and leave it in the cannula, in the little tube. And as soon as the patient starts to move, they plunge it down. <laughs> so it's a pretty dire situation. Yeah? But this is a life threatening condition. This patient will 100% die if we don't operate on them. So uh, we've got to do the best of what we can. So um, this is obviously the tummy, this is the belly button. We're going to do a big midline cut because there's no keyhole surgery options. And also in an emergency situation, we'd probably just do a big open one anyway. And um, you, difficult to see. So these are the intestines, these are the sausages, you can see they're the same. But um, in, anyway, in there, what we managed to find is we managed to find it, right, right at his stomach, he had a small hole or perforation, it was basically just pouring stomach acid into, into the actual cavity of his abdomen. And um, it's caused by lots of things. In this country, it's caused by, you know, lifestyle and diet and so on. But in, um, this guy's only 17, he hasn't lived long enough to get bad lifestyle yet. He, he has a typhoid infection, essentially, we all have to experience it. He has a typhoid infection, and it sort of burnt through his stomach um, lining. But we were able to find it, and we patched it, and fixed it, and he, <coughs> he, uh, thankfully he went home, and he was, um, was alright. So I sort of mentioned, uh, you know, trying to make the most out of the limited resources that we have, and a lot of the lessons that we've learned working in low resource settings have led us to kind of try and evolve this idea of frugal innovation, which means um, basically you have a limited pot. The w change the way you're thinking and you'll be able to do more, you know, better with, uh, with the limited resources you have. And in technology, when you're designing new technologies, it's important to always keep the user at mind. So the user could be a patient, but it could be a surgeon, it could be anyone. So the principle is user-centered design. Minimum required specifications, so no whistles and bangs, just like what, what are the you know, what are the core functionalities that we need this technology to do and just do that really well, get the basics done right and then go forward. You know, what the robot guys did is they just threw loads of cool features in like 4K and all this stuff and really don't need it, it didn't make any difference. Yeah. Um, some of the drive, you know, doing this is really difficult because you're in a market in the, in the West where they want to sell cool fancy kit to you, yeah? So it's really difficult to do it. You kind of have to embed a culture of change, so, uh, you know, you guys are all an advantage because you're, you're, you know, you're, you're younger, you've got a you're fresh mind and so on, so always try and be that driver for change and just think, you know, as long as you think that you're protecting patients or cats and dogs or whatever you work with, um, sorry, uh, you know, um, always try and make the change, believe in yourself. And this concept of interdisciplinary collaboration, you know, where you're working with people from different specialties, it's really important because that's when they ask you the dumb question or the question that they think is silly and you're like, ah, wish I'd thought of that because that's absolutely spot on. And yeah, whatever you do should be trying, you should try and be sustainable because the bottom line is that the NHS is provided for us for the rest of the, uh, you know, for the rest of existence. We can't let it go because otherwise we'll end up in a situation where we walk down the street and I'll crack with my insurance cover it. You know, what are my kids going to do because I'll be off work and so on. So we just don't want to go down that road at all. And there's sometimes this battle between like high cool tech, like you know whatever, like um, robots and shiny things. 
and then through Lumovation, really what we're understanding now is you can apply a lot of the principles that we're learning from low resource settings to high technology, you know. Um, you can still have cutting edge technology working on whatever you want, you know, an AI, an artificial intelligence algorithm. But if you, you built it with frugal principles in mind, it'll be much more cost effective. So I'm just going to end and talk to you a little bit about where I think the future is. Does anyone read the BMJ? British Medical Journal. If you want to be a doctor, read it, because they might ask you about it in the interviews. Don't like, memorise it, just read a few articles, be interested in it. Anyway, this was this month, um, talking about, you know, will artificial intelligence steal our jobs? Um, maybe at some point, probably. And does anyone know who Babylon is? Did you watch anyone watch Horizon? I thought you guys were interested in science, you know? Watch Horizon on BBC iPlayer, man, it's cool, it's really cool. Anyway, Babylon or this artificial intelligence company that everyone hates in London because they're getting up part of the press. Um, they basically do the GP at hand, so you can just get your phone out and talk to a GP, or you can go through um, an algorithm and it tells you what's wrong with you and so on. Basically, they, the whole um, Horizon show was about how they're not actually that good. Um, but anyway, artificial intelligence is coming, and you guys, you're going to live in a world where, we, well, we all are, uh, I hope we're all going to live in a world where. It'll, it'll be commonplace that things will be automated for us. You know, algorithms and machines are doing a lot of things for us in our daily lives. And, and will it ever come into our tech? I mean, yes, of course, probably. Um, obviously, I'm biased, so a lot of the stuff that I'm interested in is to do with surgery. But the, the Royal College of Surgeons, which are based in London, they're like in charge of our standards and so on, they've got a commission on the future of surgery and new technologies. So for any of you who want to build technology or work in science and so on, these are some of the key players that they're thinking, and I think they apply to most industries as well. <coughs> so robotics, this is a newer version of the robot, essentially. I think robotics will be, play a really big role, and some parts of operations will become automated, so closing and opening and so on, that will start to become automated, I'm sure. Um, this is kind of representing the use of genetic information uh, more widely, so how can we prevent disease before it even happens, and, uh, I, I don't think it's hard to believe that one day we'll all have to have our genes sequenced at birth or just take a gene sample and sequence your genes and, and figure out what's going to be wrong with you. Artificial intelligence, as I said, um, a lot of this is going to become automated. Um, virtual reality, so um, has anyone ever used virtual reality for games or whatever? Yeah, it's really cool, isn't it? So this is actually a picture of me using virtual reality in surgery, but it's not a real operation because obviously I can't see anything. All I can see, all I can see is cobble. Uh, but it was for a promo thing they were doing in hospital. But um, surgeons are often compared with pilots because it's a safety critical environment, I guess, and we know. But pilots just think we're insane. They just think we're, we're absolutely nuts that we don't simulate. Yeah? Well, it's, it's uncomfortable to hear, but we do actually just kind of practice on patients. We are being supervised, but we haven't gone through a lot of simulation. Yeah? We've practiced the skills on models like that plastic, you know, midwife model or whatever, but that's as far as we go. But, um, I think we really need to invest in immersive technology. I think that will become a really big part of our lives. And you'll be able to simulate loads of things and train in loads of things just from the comfort of your own home or, or office. Um, <clears throat> 3D printing, so this is a model of a heart. 3D printing is a bit sort of gimmicky at the moment. Does anyone have a 3D printer? They're coming down in prices, so you can kind of blame on parents and 3D printers. Um, they're really cool. You can print whatever you want, of course, so that you can program into it. But we're printing them more and more in hospitals now for optic planning. So if you have a tumour in your brain, which is kind of close to lots of critical structures, we can print it and figure out just how close it is to plan operation. But in not too distant future, they'll be doing what they do in Grey's Anatomy, and they'll be printing organs and stuff, um, you know, for real. So you'll come in with a failing organ, and we'll just make a new one, I'm absolutely sure. And then this represents imaging. So, the, you know, at the moment we're doing everything with just light and eyes, um, but in not too distant future, everything will be guided by MRI during the operation. So in Leeds now we have two hospitals with MRI scanners in the operation. So you can kind of do it at the same time as the scan is happening. Um, you know, super cool, I think that's going to be the future. But a lot of people always ask me, like, do, do I see a time where like, a robot will be wearing a white coat and doing a consultation with you? What do you guys think? Do you think that's, that can all happen? Yeah? Does anyone want that to happen? Yeah, it's a guy furiously nodding at the back there. Okay. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I think, um, like all good answers, it's probably a bit of yes and no. Um, I think more and more will be automated, and more and more you won't, and you won't realise it isn't being done by a person. But, you know, will a human being never be in the equation? So, for example, if I'm a surgeon in the future, do I just tick a box saying robot, and the robot operates on you and does everything, including all the follow-up and everything? 
And I don't know, and uh, I mean, obviously it's better for patients, I'm happy for that to happen as long as I'm the one building the robot. But um, this is one of the reasons why I think it might not happen um, too quickly, and that's because so much has to change in society before we accept that. And that's because if I operate on you, if the robot operates on you and it goes wrong and you die, or something goes wrong, who goes to court? Who's in trouble? Is it me because I'm a surgeon because I tick the box to say robot? Or is it the computer scientists that wrote the program or the robot manufacturers? And I don't know, how, how would we ever work that out? So I think there's, there's too many unknowns and too many things that we have to figure out before that happens. A bit like driverless cars, yeah? I think that's a good idea. I'd love that because I drove all the way down from the East End. I could have done like three hours worth of work. Um, but then when something goes wrong, who's at fault? You know, it's a bit tricky. So anyway, just something to think about. Um, I'm sorry, I included one slide about med school, for, for med school um, people. And this is because the interviews are coming up soon. Some of you might have interviews. I mean, well done. We'll talk about it more later. But the key is to just practice, practice, practice. And obviously, any of you guys who have interviews, just practice them with different people. Doctors, vets, scientists. Super simple, really. Just smile and be friendly. I wasn't very good. I only got one interview. And um, I just sat there and smiled and said I wanted to be a doctor and just told them all the you know, interesting stuff that I find interesting. And they, uh, they kindly said yes. Yeah, just watch, watch a bit of TV, literally just watch the news every now and then, watch, um, you know, watch Horizon, you don't have to read the BMJ back to back, but just be interested in, you know, <coughs> whatever's happening in science now, it's a fast changing environment, so you always kind of need to be up to date a little bit, and just relax and be yourself, know your motivations, like why do you actually want to be a doctor, you know, um, or vet, or whatever, it might be because you like science and help people, but everyone kind of says that, so think about your own personal reasons as well, yeah, it might be because you want to use technology to help people, or whatever. Know the university, there's nothing more embarrassing than they're like, so why do you want to come to this university and you tell them something about a course that they don't run or you've got the wrong city, I've got friends who've done that. So know the university of course, and that, yeah, again, there's no substitute for lots of practice. And if you do want to be a medical student, um, um, this is a good book. Um, there might be a more recent version, but I get that book and read it. Um, you don't have to read it cover to cover and take the best bits from it, or take the best bits from everyone's advice and use that, but um, you know, there's lots of books out there on diet. So, I've spoken a little bit about technology, and obviously I, I'm a doctor and I still want to be a surgeon, but I'm interested in how we make technology better and doing research and so on. But you always have to remember, you know, what's your role? And this is the physician's oath. I'm actually really sad, and this is a picture of the one I have on my wall. Um, but if you want to be a doctor in five and six years' time, you'll be standing up at graduation with your little certificate and your family behind you, and you'll be saying that. And it's, um, it's quite an important thing, you know, at the end of the day, regardless of what you do, you're going to be the advocate for patients, and all the patient is is a vulnerable person, yeah? so you never ever forget that. That's always going to be your role, even if you've started a really cool robotics company and you're making loads of money, you're still an advocate for the patient, yeah? so always have that in mind. But I think we should always try and be these fish that are constantly jumping into bigger bowls, yeah? trying to think about, a bit outside the box, you know, how can we make uh, the situation better for our patients and ourselves. And when I was building this PowerPoint, a friend of mine was saying, well, actually, the fish is still just a fish swimming in a bowl of water. It's not something, you know, not super new, is it? So he said, you know, the real innovators are the flying fish. So, tr so try and be more like the flying fish. I don't know why the fish was such a big role in my PowerPoint today, but try and think outside the box, you know, how can you, how can you really be truly innovative? And I think this is the last slide. And this is the main theatre in Sierra Leone where we're working. And um, they have this motto, which is a cutting time saves lives. And um, I'll never forget it because um, your time is the most precious resource you have, right? And it sounds really cheesy, and I didn't believe it when I sat with you, but my mum always used to say, time goes really fast. And it doesn't really feel like that when you're you know, a student and so on. But it does go really, really, really quick. And you can do a lot of good stuff with your time, but you have to try and think, you know, why am I here? What's my purpose? Try and be innovative, think outside the box, do something new. So that's all I wanted to say. Please follow me on Twitter if I don't have any friends. Um, so I'm always looking for more friends. Feel free to email me as well. And if you're interested in the research that we're doing, I'm sorry it's a bit corporate, but feel free to follow us on Facebook and Twitter here as well. Yeah? And that's all I have to say. So thanks very much for your time.